Jonathan's actually going to join this time. Who joined last time? Jazzy and... No, not real names. Not real names. Yeah. Saf Homo, Destruct Icon, uh, In Your Butt. Someone joined as In Your Butt, really? my so website. Your butt. Yeah, they're silly. You should join yourself. I did not, but that would have been funny. Well, I should join myself, huh? That's what he said last time. He was like, add one to your account. I was like, yeah, I'll do that. I'm uh, just doing an ad right now, so I'll let it rock. Oh, wait. <clears throat> I should join it to my phone. Yeah, <laughs> throw a number on there. <laughs> Get it. Can I help you? Zeus, what do you want? Get out of here. He's getting bigger, too. Yeah, he's huge. Uh, oh, hey, last night, Brian came over to oh. spend the night. And I just went in the bathroom right now. There's no toilet paper. And I never gave him a towel. So, <laughs> nice, right? so I don't know what he did nice, right? in the morning. but Maybe he used toilet paper. Yeah, whatever. Okay, so. Hey, I'm Ryan. That's Adam over there. Ah. And uh, Adam's looking to get into a security operations center type role. So we're going to be just going through some fundamental type of stuff. Here we have Kali Linux. This is the newest rolling 2019.01 release. If I go over here, do that, zoom in, that should be good. I'm gonna do a cat Etsy release, and there's the information. So there's 2019.1. I just loaded this up, and some random tips that I like to show folks are the following. So you know on Windows, the Windows key and then E opens Explorer? Well, what I like to do is I like to map essentially Windows E to whatever the file manager is for Linux. So in Kali, it's called Nautilus. So what I did is you go over to Applications, Usual Applications, and you scroll down, and you go to System Tools, Preferences, and then go up to Settings. Is there any way that you can find out in the, file, in the operating system what the file system is called? Yes, I'll show you that in a moment. So in here, go down to, I don't know what I just did. Uh, that, 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 that. What are we doing? Keyboard. Where's keyboard? Where'd it go? I just did this earlier. Did I click the wrong thing? Do it again. Usual <laughs> applications. Uh, system tool. Come on. System tools. Preferences. Oh, that's what happened. Preferences. Stop. Settings. No, that's the same damn thing. Where's keyboard? <laughs> I just did this. You see keyboard in there? Oh, no. I updated and keyboard's gone. No, that's not it. No, Adam. What did I do? I was going to show you how I set my hotkeys, and now I forgot. That's whack. Anyone watching this is like, oh, starting off strong. <laughs> starting off strong, bro. Good job. Good job. No, I'm telling you, I went up to, yeah, it's just setting. So will you stop that? This damn menu, you go like this, and it's like, oh, you want that? I'm like, no, I don't want that. Yeah, yeah I'm going to do the same. Three times a charm. Third time is a charm. I don't know where the hell it is. Huh, weird. No, it's just called... Keyboard is it under devices? Oh, damn it! All right, under keyboard, <laughs> and then you scroll down to the bottom, and there's a plus sign. So you'll see I added these two custom shortcuts. Can you see that in the screen? Yeah, so I added launch terminal, which is super plus T in, in Linux. That it will at least in a bunch or a Debian based ones, they call super the Windows key. Oh, okay. So I said it, I called it launch terminal. The command to launch the terminal, at least in Kali and most versions of GNOME, well, many versions of GNOME, I should say, because, you know, there's GNOME and KDE as the windowing managers, mm -hmm. um, is just GNOME-terminal, and then I set it to super plus T. So by doing this, just holding down Windows and hitting T, boom. And then I can do Windows up arrow, and then I can do, because I'm in VMware, I got to do control shift and then plus sign to zoom in. And then, yay, we got stuff going on, and people can see what I'm typing. Meanwhile, I added another one. I called it launch Nautilus, and you'll see the command is Nautilus dash dash browser. And then I set that to super E, super, ooh, girl, so that it opens up the file manager. So if you're wondering, you know, there's a lot of different file managers. And I can't remember the names of any of them except for this one right now, because <laughs> why, why would I right now? If you're wondering, like, well, what the hell's the name of it? Um, I have some really ghetto ways to find it. Now, there's official ways to find it, or you can just Google things, but that's boring. So one of the ways I like to do it is the following. You ready for this? Uh -huh. Is I like to do a PS AUX, right? So process listing and then AUX. I like to pipe this to less. Uh -huh. And I hit this guy. And then you can see everything that's running, right? So if you were to scroll down and you're like, well, which one's the, the file manager? You want to see the really ghetto way to do it? This is, I came up with this earlier today because I was bored. As I just run top. And when you have it, <laughs> hold on, hold on. When you have it 
So you just oh, click on files and you're like, you know, what is this, right? So if you grab the window and you just start going like this with the window and you start going crazy with the window, oh, it's not, oh, it's too big. There, right there. See, Nautilus. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because you're you're making it so active that the OS is like, oh, okay, well, that's that's active. So let me do it like this. Uh, I'm going crazy with the window. Oh, Nautilus. Ah, isn't that great? And I was like, oh, okay. So if you do Alt F2, and then you start typing a not and hit tab. Let me spell it correctly. And hit tab, you get Nautilus. Okay. And then uh, basically, I, I just remember the dash dash browser makes sure that it brings up like this window here. So anyway, I like doing that. I'm going to hit Q to quit top. Exit out of that. Ooh. Burp off camera. I'm on beer number two. Excuse me. So anyways, boom. There's your files. And there's terminal. So, uh, interview type of stuff, right? One of the things I like to do, I've done, I don't know, over 100 freaking interviews for our security operations center and for and I help people with resumes and, and all kinds of stuff, right? So, one of the things I came up with, uh, I don't remember when or how, is, uh, so if I just, you know, listing here, we got a file called unknown.txt. So, if we do cat unknown.txt, and I'll zoom in all the way. You get that. So we show people this. And then, for example, and if you don't know this, you got to leave. So, <laughs> so if you look at it, if, if I just say, like, you know, what is that? What is it? Okay. It's a MAC address. Yeah. I mean, obviously, um, we're, <laughs> you and I, are, you're like, yeah, it's a MAC address, stupid. <laughs> but you'd be surprised. Some people are like, well, I don't know. And like, but, okay, come on. It's a MAC address. So you have a MAC address, right? And then, so I call this, um, the six piece puzzle. <laughs> I don't know. I don't really have a, I don't really have a name for it. I just kind of made that up right now. But what I do is I just draw this on the board, like a whiteboard. I love the whiteboard. Oh God. I just boop, 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 boop. what's that? Ah, whiteboarding is so fun. So you have this, right? And then you basically say, like, okay, so you have this little guy right here. Uh, it's a Mac address, right? Mm -hmm. So then how many bytes is that? Yeah, how many Six. So a MAC address is basically made up of, of hexadecimal characters. Sometimes they're separated by colons like we have here. Sometimes they're dashes and sometimes it's just the num well numbers, I guess. The hexadecimal characters, right? So there's 12 characters in total. However, a lot of people come in, they're like, oh yeah, I've got this degree. I have a grad degree in forensics. And I'm like, all right, cool. How many bytes is this? And they just start throwing out the zaniest damn numbers, dude. They're like 150. I don't think I've had that one, but you know what I mean? They're just like, ah, ah. So, you know, how do you determine how many bytes this is? Well, a hexadecimal character itself is, so if this whole thing is six bytes, right? Well, then how much is one hexadecimal character? Two bytes. Or one byte. Or half a byte. Sorry. Stop it, Zeus. <laughs> Our dog's all whining. Woo! Uh, yeah, so it's half a byte. So a hexadecimal character is actually half a byte. How many bits are in a byte? Eight. Eight. You'd be amazed by how many people are like, again, I have all these degrees, and, and you're like, well, how many bits are in a byte? And they're like, 16? You're like, dude, what? <laughs> okay, so there's eight bits in a byte, right? Okay, well, what about... Um, okay, so in that case, how many bits is this? 48. 48, right? It's 48 bits. Now, here's the thing. Technically, because we have the colons here, what's being displayed is actually not 48 bits. But the idea is that a MAC address in general is 6 bytes or 48 bits. So then we start going into things like, all right, well, how much is a nibble? Like, what's a nibble? A nibble? Yeah. It's half a byte. It's half a byte. Yeah. And in most architectures, it's four, it's four bits. Yeah. And then what about a word? Two bytes. Two bytes. What about a double word? <laughs> ah, two times two it's four bytes all right now some people are like what about the architecture eh, whatever we're working with standard eh, microsoft based if you for that matter if you want whatever architectures so essentially what we have is trying to get the understanding from someone that they recognize a that it's a mac address uh, b they recognize it's comprised of hex decimal characters and then we start going into like what's hex and for that matter what's ascii so, like, we have the hexadecimal letter A, right? Do you happen to know the ASCII equivalent? Or, oh, I screwed that up. Excuse me. If I have the ASCII letter A, do you happen to know the hexadecimal equivalent of that? Uh, 
I'm giving you a hint right there. 41. <laughs> I put it there for a reason. It's 41. So let me give you an example. We're going to go with Python. And again, I just downloaded Kali. This is recent version. It comes 2.7.16 because only heathens and dirty, dirty people use 3.x. And if you use 3.x, that's fine. But you're a bad person is all I'm saying. So when you're in Python, you can do stuff like this. If I just do OXA, right? Or excuse me, what am I doing? If I do OX41, it says, well, that's decimal 65, okay. right? So you, okay, well, so I have decimal 65. What's the hex version of decimal 65? Well, it's OX41, right? Meanwhile, if I do something like this, if um, I have, let's say, uh, actually, let's pause for a moment and let's open up Firefox and let's look up a uh, hex ASCII table. Go over to images and which one looks pretty? Oh, what's this one? This one looks pretty. I like this one. I'm going to do a uh, copy image location, go like that and zoom in. Get rid of that. And that looks pretty right there. Okay, so if we have over here, we've got do 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 hexadecimal 41. And you see right here, the character itself is A. See right there? Yeah. So, at, and by the way, I'm making assumptions here that folks are familiar with the general concept of decimal, hexadecimal, uh, octal, eh, and character, okay? So, uh, excuse me, uh, ASCII. ASCII was originally seven bits. The first bit are right, technically the most important bit. So, oh, where's my where's my mirroring? Which hand is this? Which hand is that? <laughs> Where am I? All right, the, the most significant bit was used for parity. So anyways, it was seven bits, and then when they came out with um, extended ASCII, they just used all eight bits to represent it. So anyways, we see the letter A is decimal 65 and hex 41, right? So where, oh, and by the way, when you start, so when you go like, all right, 41 is A, Sometimes what I do is I go like this, I'm like, all right, um, what about, and I'll just exit out of Python for a moment, and I'll just say, like, all right, hey, so we have uh, ABC, and I say, all right, ASCII ABC, what would that be in hex? And if they're like, well, you know, I'm not super sure, but they're like, okay, well, I'll give you a hint. A is 41 in hex. So going back into Python, if I go ABC, I can do encode hex and you actually get the answer 41 is a so then obviously 42 is b and 43 is c and from knowing that a capital a starts at 41 you can kind of do the calculations that is they can do the calculations if they actually know hex decimal goes 0 through 9 and then it goes a through f right for uh 10 to 15 if they don't know that they're going to screw up the math so sometimes what i'll do is i'll ask them like oh, okay uh, what if, and I'll just see if they can do it in their head, right? I'll be like, what is the letter Z in hex? Like capital Z in ASCII. What is that in hex? 67. And what? 167? I don't know, see. Decimal. Do you memorize that? No, I added 26. LX5A. Oops, what did I just do? Oh, sorry. Int. What are you doing? 90. All right, so uh, now, where would you most likely see a whole bunch of A's just like printed out? Like when you're in incident response and you're responding to tickets and you see like an alert and it's like a log file and it's a web log, I don't know, whatever. And you see a whole bunch of A's, maybe something after it, but in general, you see a whole bunch of A's. You know when that might be used? I know the letter I use is too. Where? Uh, yeah, yeah, we talked about, yeah, 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 so you'll see a bunch of A's because a lot of zero, okay, okay. White spaces. And White, yeah, yeah, spaces yeah. okay, so another place you'll see that is a lot of times when attackers are trying to get into a system, especially if they're trying to overflow a buffer, they'll be doing something like Python-C, which means command, like throw a command at Python, okay. and then you'll see something like this. <laughs> hey, hey, shut up. You'll see like print a, someone's here, I don't know. You'll see like print A times 20. And then you get a bunch of A's. So what they, hey, hi, we're streaming. You want to be part of the stream? This is Brian. Here he comes, here he comes, here he comes. Ah, there's Brian. This is Brian. Oh, yeah. 
I got a truck full of whiskey. Whoa. <laughs> oh, you you got a truck. truck full of whiskey? Yeah. Oh, I got to end the stream. <laughs> I, I got to go. <laughs> Brian's got a truck full of whiskey. Nice. So if I do like A times 100, usually what they're trying to do is they'll run some kind of command like this, and they're trying to pipe all these A's into a buffer. Yeah. And then eventually they're going to be looking, like if they're using a debugger, they're going to attach to the process or whatever, a GDB, and they're going to try to find out where those A's go into the IP. The in, uh, instruction pointer? What am I trying to say? Instruction pointer? I'm totally blinking right now. IP. EIP, extended instruction pointer? Yeah, that's where the CPU is going to... Anyway, we're, get, we're getting a little too advanced on the, the attacking side, but in general, when you see a whole bunch of A... Like, if you have an alert, and there's a bunch of A's in there, like A8, capital A specifically, they do it all the time. A bunch of capital A's, you're like, nah, you're doing something weird. Right? And your alert, depending on how you receive the alert, I'm going to pipe this. We're just going to go with... 10 A's, and I'm going to pipe it to XXD, which is like a, a hex dump tool in, in all, I almost said all Linux, but you know, in the common Linux distributions. Mm -hmm. So I pipe it to XXD, and we see 41, 41, 41, 41, 41, blah, 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 blah. And then we see this little fart right there. More on that coming up a little bit later. I think you and I have already talked about that. But more on that coming up. So, okay, so I want to talk about uh, general hex stuff. Let's go back to the MAC address, right? So the MAC address is comprised of six bytes. There's two separate sections to a MAC address. There's the first section, the first three bytes, mm -hmm. and then the second section. Mm -hmm. What's the first section referred to as? What are the first three bytes normally known as? Manufacturer's code. Manufacturer's code, often known or uh, officially, I guess, called the OUI, Organizational Unit o Identifier. Okay. Not Odentifier, <laughs> that'd be O-U-O. <laughs> yeah, OUI. So let's just do this. Let's go if config Ethernet zero on my machine on this VM that I spun up. And you look here and we have this line right here called ether, right? And the first three bytes are OOC29. So let's take this and we're gonna go back to Firefox and we're gonna do this, close that, that, and we're gonna do uh, OUI lookup. Usually Wireshark comes up first. There it is. So the Wireshark OUI lookup tool. I clicky and I just drop it right in here, right? So three bytes. I hit find and right down here at the bottom, you see that it says VMware. Boom. So it's able to identify that the machine on the network is VMware, right? Or that it's produced, the NIC is produced by VMware. Yeah. These can be spoofed, which is coming up like right, right now. That's what we're going to do. But in general, that's what that means. Okay. What's that? Oh, snap, son. Woo, look at the ice. You see that ice? Oh, look at that. <laughs> you see that ice? That's Brian's ice right there. What's it called? Artisan ice? Artisan ice, baby. Artisan ice. Oh, man. So good. Oh, I wasn't going to drink more than... I was going to say I wasn't going to drink today. I'm a liar. I, I wasn't going to drink more than the two or three beers I already had. Well, now you Cheers. Are. Cheers. What is that? What did you got there? Tolmore Dew 12 here. Oh, goodness. We'll show over to the camera. One of the, one of the oldest <laughs> Irish whiskeys in the land. Oh, get a girl. Yeah, baby. Get that Tully. Hey, every time I stream, can you do this? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to need you yeah, to move back from... dollars a stream. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, cheers. Uh, apparently, we're doing this now. Okay. And the stream just got more fun for me. Okay. So we have a MAC address, and here it's showing it's VMware, right? When someone's attacking, excuse me, a system. <laughs> 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 Boop. I know, <laughs> you already got me. When someone's attacking the system, they're gonna wanna change their MAC address, right? There's a, a bunch of different ways to change your MAC address. One of the most simplistic is simply using if config. So oh, let's spell it correctly. So I have if config ethernet zero, mm -hmm. and you'll see here we have this line right there and it shows my ethernet MAC address, right? Yep. So one of the things you can do is I can just do if config uh, eth zero down. And then what I can do is I can basically set the MAC address using a, an if config yep. command. Yep. So one of the things I, I just wanna do something else that's kind of random you know, a lot of InfoSec folks or IR responders and, you know, I call us hands-on incident responses. I just like to say that a lot. I don't know. What we like to do is we like to use variables a lot of times. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do export. Uh, let's call it new Mac equals, and we're going to set it to, if you use ticks, so not the single quote, but ticks. And then I do like cat unknown, how do you spell unknown, dot text. And I hit enter. Then what I can do is I can, when you run environment, ENV in Linux, and you hit enter, it shows all your environmental variables, right? So I'm going to do environment, and we're going to grep for Mac. And then we see here that we've set, it's not persistent, by the way, because we didn't do that, but we just set it for this session, that we have new Mac, and it's equal to the Mac address, right? So right now in if config, if I run it, you won't see Ethernet 0, because I brought it down. The network is down. The interface is down. Mm -hmm. So then I just do if config, and I'm cheating with my notes over here, because I always forget. <laughs> ETH0 HW, so hardware address. Yeah. And then what I can do here is I can actually set it to my environmental variable, which I set to new Mac. I hit enter. Nope, I failed. Oh, let's let's see what I did. Uh, if config, yeah, is that not, is that not right? What'd you do, stupid? Ethernet zero hardware. Oh, so stupid. It's hardware ether. Dum dum. Well, let's spell it correctly. The name of the hardware device. I didn't read my notes properly over there. I, I, I wasn't going to do any notes. And they're, they're good notes. The one time I read the notes, I fucked it up. <laughs> Anywho. Yeah, well. It's truck full of virus whiskey. <laughs> so now if I do if config up, or excuse me, Ethernet zero up, and then we do if config Ethernet zero, we'll see that my MAC address is now the one that I made up earlier, right? So what is this? Um, it's actually kind of funny. I pulled this out of my butt and I looked it up earlier before you came over because I was like, well, I wonder if it maps to anything. And it totally does. Does it really? Yeah, it does. So let's open you up. You guessed on this. Ah, I just picked one and I was like, oh, look, it's a thing. Yeah. So let's do a uh, OUI look up again. There's a bunch of sites. I like the Wireshark one, whatever. And then I put the little booger butt right there. I hit find and you'll see apparently this is RivetNet. <laughs> Rivet Networks. <laughs> I don't even know what that is. So let's Google that. What do they make? Rivet Networks is the parent company of, oh, snap, son, of Killer Networking. I have a killer neck in my computer over here. Do you? Yeah, dude, Killer is. Now you have a spooked one. Hey, hey. Killer's killer. Killer, oh, you <laughs> fucking ruined it. <laughs> you took my joke. That's kind of rude, Adam. That's kind of rude. How dare you? All right, well, anyway. So we had the new MAC address. Adam just walked away. I don't know. What are you doing? Hey. Hello? I guess we're going to wait for Adam now. When he comes back, I'm going to show him MAC Changer, which comes with Kali Linux. And if you run MAC Changer dash dash help, you get the various options. And if you pick up your whiskey glass, you get whiskey. Hi. 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 Okay. <clears throat> Manly. Here we go. So Mac changer dash dash help. It comes with Kali Linux. I think you just sudo apt install it. I don't know. Oh. You can grab it from source, compile it, whatever. So in Mac changer, you can do a completely random hmm. by doing this little fart right here. Or what I can do is I can just set the random uh, burp, 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 burp. Uh, which is the one that I want right here. Random Mac of same kind, meaning the oh. first three bytes will be the same, same and then the next three bytes will be different, right? So if I want to do that, like I'll just say um, Mac changer dash A, which is another apparently, or I can use dash dash another, and then eat zero. And it says, oh, you lying little bastard. No, so you did the wrong one. You did the wrong one. Of the same kind, dash of any kind. Dash e, don't change it. Yeah, Adam, pay attention. <laughs> I'm, I'm showing you. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, well, apparently we got a new one uh, for Vitic Group. So let's do an, an E, like I said, and then do E0, and then it once again picks another Vitic Group, but this time the last three bytes are different. So I had set it to this, and I guess I it back to that. So the hardware address itself is uh, set in stone, per se, right? So Mac Changer provides the ability... Excuse me. To use dash P. Dash P is permanent, basically saying like reset it, right? So I go dash P ETH zero. 
And now it goes back to my VMware one. Okay, so I'm going to go back to my history. I want, oh, should I, do you have to bring it down first? I assume you do. Oh, okay, well that worked. I always take it down first. So anywho, uh, we have this little guy right here. And now what I'm gonna do is, oh, before I do that, so when you have a MAC address, right, especially in interviews, we ask like, okay, so what protocol or which protocol is our MAC address is typically associated with? ARP. ARP, the address resolution protocol, right? So which layer of the OSI model does ARP operate at? Uh, layer two. Layer two. <laughs> so what we can do is we can have some fun. I've changed my MAC address, right? Stealthy. Super cool. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to run Wireshark. I'm going to spell it correctly. It helps. It helps. And in Wireshark, there's a couple things I want to show you here. So instead of just hitting capture, what I can do is I can click on the capture options and I can tell it I only want to capture, not, not that, I only want to capture ARP. I said Ethernet, and I hit start. It's only going to capture ARP traffic. You can generate some by running ARP and then ARP A N O. Oh. Hello, love. If config, it's zero down. Network adapters down, I know. And then we'll do it uh, up. If config, eat zero. Okay, now we got traffic. All right, do over. So we have a display filter that we want. ARP on ethernet. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, fuck it, I'll do it on any. Yeah, and I'll do ARP A N, ARP. A and ARP, and then we get ARP traffic over here. So I'll we'll stop this little bugger. Can I know this display address? What am I doing? All right, anyway, let's guess my filter didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> the whiskey got me. <laughs> Any hoodle. <laughs> I must not have checked the box a second time. Whatever. So you'll notice, even in my captured traffic now, it shows that my source is the spoofed address right there. So another thing that I want to show you is that in Wireshark, a lot of folks, and I'm going to Full screen it, and we're gonna zoom in here. So this button right there, this little guy, gives you an auto width. So you see how my, I'm pointing at my screen like they can, you see that right there? How about I just use the mouse, stupid? So you see how here you can't see these because I, I zoomed in. Yeah. If you hit this guy, it's like auto fit, yeah. essentially. What's it officially called? Resize packet list, comp oh, it's auto, auto fit, fit, auto fit. So if you go down here, and you click on address resolution. So there's three different panes in Wireshark. And I have a whole, I, you and I have gone over Wireshark before, and I have a whole, um, on on YouTube, I have a whole, let's just do it. Here, watch this. Firefox, youtube.com, I think it's C, Ryan Chapman J. Did I make that up? Yeah, there it is. So there's um, these six different videos that I did for Cal State Fullerton. Uh, Cal State Fullerton University, uh, uh, an, ex an ex friend of mine, we don't talk anymore. <laughs> was his, yeah, he doesn't like me anymore. Mm -hmm. <sighs> I was sad. Anyways, uh, he was an, an adjunct professor there and they have a cybersecurity group and so I did this workshop for them. So it's called the CSUF Cyber Forensics Workshop. There's me, like five years ago, six years ago, no beard, uh, there's no beard there at all. Look at that, oh, I look so young. And my voice is all like, oh, hello, everyone. <laughs> so in here, I go over like a bunch of Wireshark stuff. I have some college students like listening in. So I have a whole thing on that. But even so, I want to hit on a couple topics here in Wireshark. Wireshark has three primary panes. Packet list up top, packet details in the middle, and packet bytes at the bottom. So when I have ARP and I click on it, you'll notice highlights I'm doing the hand thing again. You notice the highlights down at the bottom. Oh yeah, if you move your mouse over, it messes it up and you have to re-click. So I'll use my hand. So at the bottom, it highlights those, those bytes, right? So we have address resolution protocol. And if I click these individual items, it's showing me different parts of the, the protocol, right? So we're looking at Linux cooked capture. I don't, that's actually not what I wanted. I think I may have installed the wrong driver for this, but that's okay. Uh, I want, no, I don't want that. Go away. Let's do that again. 
Do, 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 do. Let's click here. ETH zero. And there's my address. I want to capture ARP, not A-R-O. A-R-P. Oh. Fine. I'll click the right thing and type it, whatever. And I'll hit start. Let's go back over here. ARP, ARP, dash A-N, ARP, dash A. Hold on, we'll get something. There you go. All right, we're gonna stop it, click it. There we go. So we have ethernet right here, right? Mm -hmm. So when I click on, all right, let me drop that down. When I click on frame, it highlights everything in the packet bytes, right? Mm -hmm. If I click on ARP, it highlights that stuff. But when I click on ethernet, the layer two stuff, see at the very top here, and I'll start scrolling, like going like this, and it's gonna mess it up. But if I drop it down, we have a couple things. I click on destination, see how it highlights those six bytes? Mm -hmm. And then those six bytes? Mm -hmm. And then those, how many? One. Yep, two bytes. All right, <clears throat> O or uh, zero eight, I always say O for zero. So zero eight zero six. Okay, if I go back over to Firefox, do we have that open still? Nope. And we're gonna do, uh, da, 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 da. Ethernet uh, header. Ethernet frame. No, 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 no. Go back. Images. Uh, yeah, this one works. Copy image location. Zoom in. So you'll see that for an Ethernet frame, the first thing you have is the MAC header. It's a total of 14 bytes, right? Let me zoom in a little bit more. So a total of 14 bytes. We have the destination MAC address, the source address, and then Ether type. And here's an example of 0x or 0800. So I go back over here, this one's 0806, right? So the first six bytes is always gonna be your destination. So it does destination and then source, which usually when you're reviewing a lot of different log types, you have the opposite, right? You have source and then dest. So here, they decided to go with destination and source. So it says type is ARP, which is being translated from 0806. So if I go back to Firefox and I say ethernet types and which article do I, oh, ether type. There's a Wikipedia article just for it. And I scroll down, here you go. Ethernet type, if the number was 0800, it's gonna be IP4. If it's 0806, however, it means it's going to be encapsulating ARP. And that's how Wireshark knows that the next item that comes up is ARP. And for that matter, if I do ARP frame, no, sorry. Uh, ARP, oh, that works, I guess. I was gonna do ARP header, same concept. And this one's good. So it says here the first 16 bytes, or bits, so uh, two bytes here is hardware type. And if I go right here, hardware type, I click on it, and you'll notice at the bottom right there, I get 0001, all right, two bytes. So a one just happens to mean ethernet. Next to that is a protocol type, two bytes. 0800 happens to be, see right there, protocol type. And then if I look even further up, if I were to look up like ARP, what are we doing again? Protocol type. Uh, will this have it? Wikipedia for the win? Wikipedia for the win? Oh. Da, 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 da. Here's something. What's this? I don't know what this is. I'm just clicking on random things at this point. Yeah, I totally am. All right, well, you get the idea. So Wireshark, the bytes section is critical. A lot of times people like people often think, oh, Wireshark knows exactly what's in those packets. Like, no, it's just it's just reading the raw values and trying to associate those with known header types. And if it finds that, it goes like, oh, okay, well, that's what that is. And then the bytes down at the sec the bytes section down at the bottom gives you all the cool information. All right, so in, like in an interview process, this is the kind of thing that we'd bring up. Be like, well, what's this? And like, well, what does that mean right there? And we'll just like, just you click on it. And by the way, when I go like this, it actually moves. See in the packet details? It actually highlights that. So I go like, what's this? And they're like, 0001. I don't know. And you're like, dude, when I click on that, it's it's <laughs> highlighting in the details section, the hardware type link. It, it's literally telling you. So just a little more like lower level information on how Wireshark works, right? That's kind of how we're, what we're trying to get out. So people, oh, I use Wireshark, that, you know, on the resume, top of the, Wireshark. Like, oh, cool. Uh, all right, well, uh, what's that? Uh, I don't know. 
0.0806 hex decimal. What's that? I don't know. How many bytes is that? I don't know. And you're like, ah, booger butt. <laughs> that's, what I, that's what I call Allie. Yeah, that's what I call. I call my daughter booger butt, and I, I, I don't really say that in an interview, but. Okay, so let's go back to if config. Some other general stuff. Um, people say, oh, I know how to use Linux. I'm like, okay, well, you know, what do you do in Linux? I can move directories and delete files. Okay. Uh, RM dash RF. Like, you know, I, I want to do this. Let me get rid of that real quick. <laughs> RM dash RF slash start. Yeah, that's what you want to do, right? <laughs> so, uh, knowing how to do like text processing is really big for hands on incident response, right? Mm -hmm. So, if I have the results here that we have from if config and I want to pull out this line right there, I or any line that may have that. Say I've got 20 MAC addresses, 20 different interfaces. Hey, Zeus. Mm -hmm. And I want to pull them out. What's an easy way to do it? I pipe I it to pipe what? Pipe the results into a text file? You could do that. You could pipe it into a text file or just use grep. Oh, there you go. So for grep, we notice that this line happens to start with the word ether. So if I do a grep for ether, I get that, yeah. right? Yeah. And then if you're like, well, what if you want it just the MAC address? There's a bunch of different ways to do it. Okay, one of them is to use cut. Cut will automatically, or you can specify a delimiter, but it will automatically delimit a line. Like I have this particular line that's being fed in and piped into cut. And then I can say like, well, I want field, like let's look at field one. Oh, the whole thing is field one to cut. So you can specify a delimiter. I want the delimiter to be space. The problem with using cut in this capacity is that these are all spaces. Oh. So if you count these, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Technically there's seven spaces there, right? Mm -hmm. So if I go like, all right, well, what's field eight? All right, fuck that up. All right, nine. Okay, so field nine happens to be the word ether. Yeah. So if the delimiter is space and this is field nine, then this is gonna be field. 10, and there's my MAC address. Another way of doing it is using awk. And awk syntax is like this. For awk, print dollar sign zero, I meant to do a zero there, will actually give you the entire line. But it does more intelligent uh, field extractions, I guess is what I'm looking at. Mm -hmm. And so if I do print one, it's ether. So in that case, print two, and there's a MAC address. So what if, I want the MAC address, but I don't want it to include the colons. So just for clarification, the, the awk print variable is taking the first non-white space character or non-white space yep. variable and putting that into dollar sign two. Yep. Okay. Yep. It tokenizes it into uh, two. But it I, always says non-white space variable. Right? Yeah. Okay. Well, you can also uh, awk is a whole programming language technically. So like that is the most basic example you could possibly give of awk. But in an interview, like we're just going like, do you, have you ever used awk before? You know, like that. Okay. So in here, so I have my Mac address like this. And if I want, let's say I want to get rid of those colons. Mm -hmm. I'm drinking it. I'm just looking. Brian's forcing me to drink it. <laughs> so rude, Brian. I thought you said you're coming back at like two. What time it's is it? Is it, is it <laughs> <laughs> Dumb. About two uh, it's almost two o'clock. Driving all over the valley. All right, all right. <laughs> A little bit of water. Okay, so. So we have, we're using awk print to, now what if we want to get rid of the colons? Many different ways to do it, but in an interview, the idea would be like, all right, you know how to use Linux, so get rid of the colons. And there's many, many, there's a million ways to do the damn thing, to do the damn thing. Okay, one way is to use tr, specify you want to delete, and then specify the colons. Boom, gone. Another way, TR, I don't know, dude. Man, t is it trans translate? Translate or <laughs> you gotta check the man page. I don't know. So translate will let you use dash D for delete. You can specify the characters that you want gone. Another way to do it is to use something like said. 
which is the stream editor. And I'm going to give you an example of this. I can say like, so this is regular expressions, right? So with said, you use single quotes and then S stands for search. Mm -hmm. And then you get your forward slash. And I'm saying, I want to search for a colon mm -hmm. and I want to replace it with, I can replace it with farts. Oh. And then now the first, notice how the first colon gets replaced with farts. <laughs> but instead, if I simply add a G at the end of it, let me zoom out. Yeah, there, that makes, that looks better. Let me, let me go up like that. So by doing G for global, that means that every time you encounter a colon to replace it with farts. So now we got this weird Mac. I just like that. A lot of farts. Or a lot of farts. Or I can just go like that and get rid of it. If you don't have the G, just the first one. Or if you leave the G for global, meaning every time you find it, then you get rid of it. There's all kinds of other ways to do it. But the idea is to see if someone can actually do it, right? Mm -hmm. So, all right, just different text processing. Uh, let's see, we did uh, translate. TR is translate, Adam. <laughs> what does that mean? I don't know. I got to man it real quick. I thought it was trim, so what do I know? And uh, removing colons. What else did I want? To oh, another thing is to go back to the original value, right? Mm -hmm. So you have the original value. And then I start, well, I guess we already talked about 41, right? But we then ask, hey. <laughs> I then like to ask some things like, do you recognize these hexadecimal characters? Zero D, I call it OD and OA, which is wrong. It's not O, it's zero. But, right? Zero, O is so much quicker. All the wrong. So, <laughs> zero D and zero A. Now, if anyone's done enough work with a hex editor, they're going to recognize zero D and zero A. Okay. If they haven't, well, then they won't. Okay. Right? So, did we talk about that yet? Do you remember what those are? Okay, so in an operating system, when you have, for example, a text file mm -hmm. and you hit enter in that text file, mm -hmm. right? Hey, are you taking off? Yeah. You're taking your truck of whiskey? I am. Oh. I am. Okay. I'm sure I'll have some action. Okay. What time are you coming back? You said late, know. right? What's that? You said late, like 11 or something? Okay. All right. Let me know how it goes. He's taking his Bye. truck of whiskey. It's horrible. Okay. So, um, okay. OD and OA, mm -hmm. right? I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do vi example dot text. And I'm going to hit I for insert. And I'm going to say line one, enter. Line two, enter. Line three, enter. Line four. Oh, I fucked it up. <laughs> oh, Ryan. All right, line five. And I'll do one more int. In fact, I'll do a couple enters. And then I'm going to write the file. All right, when I like, write, eh, when I write that file, and then I do, if I do less example, there's my lines, right? But if I do XXD example, so I want to do a hex dump of this right here. And I hit enter. Let's zoom out one level. You'll notice that we have the ASCII representation, uh, excuse me, over here, the ASCII representation, right? Lowercase L-I-N-E, which happens to be these hexadecimal characters. So that's a lowercase L. That's a lowercase I. <laughs> and then what is hexadecimal 20 in ASCII? Space, right? And then we have the number one. So three zero is zero. 31 is one, 32, right? But then we have this, zero A as I call OA, oh, yeah. uh, incorrectly. So 0A, that is actually referred to as a line feed. And that's because, and here you see the raw output, right? You see line, space, one, and then an ASCII to see a dot. It's because it's trying to represent that control character. It's called the control character, new character, the new line character. Now in Linux, the new line character is 0A. However, in Windows, and we're going to do this. We're going to go CD mount, HGFS, VM share, like this. We're going to remove text files. I'm going to go over here on my PC. Mm -hmm. And in Windows, I'm going to do line one, line two, line three. I did it again. I did the same thing again. <laughs> That's weird. Board. That's weird, huh? <laughs> and then I'll do some extra lines at the end. And I'm going to save this to my VM share, and I'm going to call it Windows, or just Win Example, and save it. And if I do an LS here, there we go. We have Win Example right there, right? Yep. 
Okay, so now back in Linux, I do xxd win example. Now I save this text file using notepad++ and I hit enter. Here, you'll notice we have line one, right? This right, this right there. That's our 20, right? Space. But then notice that Windows uses 0D0A. These are also represented sometimes as slash R slash N, and it stands for carriage return and then line feed. This goes back to the days of printers. Mm -hmm. And back in the printer days, so let me go like this. When you're using a printer, like, you know, an actual typewriter. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Word yeah, word, yeah. So I'm like, well, no, not even that advanced. <laughs> <laughs> so when you're typing something, right, you know, you're typing and it's striking, and da, 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 right? And then when you hit enter on a typewriter, two things actually happen. Number one is a carriage return, which means, see how my blinking cursor's at the end right here? Mm -hmm. A carriage return means it goes all the way to the, the beginning. Okay. So when you're typing on a typewriter, right, and you're like type, 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 you know how the little, what the hell's it called, the little ball? What's yeah. it called? Ball. I don't know, it's, it's a carriage? Is it called a carriage? I don't know what the fuck it's called. The little, the little ball thing, right? It actually goes like this, and it goes over to the other side. It goes back to the beginning, right? But then it does a line feed, which actually means it moves the paper up. Or the older ones, you had to do it yourself, right? You crank the little dingle hopper. So a carriage return means you're at the very, your carriage is going like type, type, and it's striking, you know, using the ink and all that. Mm -hmm. A carriage return means you return to the beginning of the page. Line feed, the original line feed was you actually had to move the paper up so that you would then go down to the next line. Okay. So the way that Windows actually stores your command, you know, like when you hit an enter, right? like that, is it actually stores it using two different control characters, carriage return and line feed. Whereas Linux doesn't do that because, did I save that? No, I deleted it. All right, well, let's make a new one. Uh, Linux example.txt. I'll do it again, line one, line two. Oh, is that why? No. All right, line five, and I'll write quit. XXD Linux example, and you see here, it just does OA. So, do you remember, and don't lie. Oh, you're right, I was in the other directory. Let me go back here. Yeah, there's the example. All right, let's get rid of it now. Go back to documents, and that's not where I was. I, think. <laughs> I don't know where I was. No, yeah, I was right here, we're good. We're good, there we go. So, I had a point, what was it? Oh, remember when you used to pirate software? Don't lie. Do you remember how it would come with a .info file, .nfo? And do you remember how sometimes you would open that file and everything would be jumbled together? Yep. It would be like the release group, you know, uh, fart knockers, uh, two, three, I don't know, whatever. And then instead of having it the next line down, it would be like file name. And it'd be like kind of confusing why it was all stuffed together. Mm -hmm. Well, it's because those text files were often created on a Nixt-based environment, Linux or Unix. And when it was made in that environment, it only had the 0A. It didn't have the 0D. So when you open that in the Windows notepad, like regular notepad.exe, it would just bund like scrunch it all together. There was no there's no official proper new lines per Windows. If you open it in Notepad++, by the way, it's intelligent enough to be like, I get it. You're supposed to. But that's just that's why that would happen. There's a couple different ways you can convert these files. So for example, if I have my win example. I'm going to make a copy of this win example to, I'm just going to call it win2.txt. So one of the tools is called dos to unix okay. And if I just do man dos to unix it shows me here, dos mac to Unix and vice versa text file format converter. Okay. So to use it, it's ridiculously simple. So I go dos to Unix and then I do win example dot text. Mm -hmm. And it says I'm converting it to Unix format. And now when I do X, no, XXD for win example, mm -hmm. you'll notice now it only has OA, right? So DOS to Unix, and then for that matter, Unix to DOS are commands that come with a lot. You can just install it yourself too with, with apt or aptitude. Mm -hmm. And it will do those, you know, conversions for you. Meanwhile, I'm going to remove win example and I'm going to move win2 to win example.txt, xxd, win example. Okay, so Windows once again, right? Another way you can do it manually is to use something, it, regular expressions. So you can use sed and you can use i, which is like an in place edit. Mm -hmm. And then I can do this and then I can do, oh, you know what? Let me make a, a copy first. Hold on. 
copy win example to win two dot text. Okay, so now I'm going to use said for in place, mm -hmm. and then I'm going to do my dingle hopper. We're going to use win example, and I'm going to take any example of slash r slash in, which is in regular expressions, carriage return zero d, new line zero a, and I'm going to convert all those to just o a. I hit enter. And now, again, if I do this, that didn't work at all. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck said. I never like said. I never like said. What did I just do? Hold on. Uh, in place said? I fucked it up. I like Perl more anyway. So I'm going to use Perl, like I meant to the whole time. And I'm going to do uh, PE, which is basically give it an expression and loop through each line and, and process the command you're giving. And then I'm going to go like this and we're going to do this on the win example. And I'm going to do the same thing. Slash R slash in replace it with in. So Perl still uses the regular expression. Yeah. And I'm going to hit enter. Oh, I want to push that to uh, win to Lin dot text and then XXD win to Lin. And then now you'll notice OA, right? So let's do an example here. Uh, we're going to remove win2 and win to lin. And then we have the Windows example. So we're going to do xxd Windows example. So we're going to see, we're going to talk about hashing next is something else that comes up. People are like, what's a hash, right? So I want to like, what's a hash? Like, oh, it's a fingerprint thingy. I'm like, okay. <laughs> cool story. So we have this file, right? If I edit it using, let me copy it. Uh, when let's call it win one dot txt, and I'm gonna copy it also to win two dot txt. No, that's good. And so okay, now I'm gonna use dos to Unix. I already forgot the file name. Hold on, <laughs> I'm gonna use dos to Unix, and we're gonna go win example dot txt right, and it's gonna say converting it, and then we're gonna do that Perl method again. So I'm gonna recall the method that I use. And we're going to call it win to lin dot txt. And then what I can do is I can be like, all right, well, does that produce technically the same file? And this is part of when we get into like, well, what's a hash? So we ask, you know, I ask, what's a hash? What is a hash? What is a hash? Yeah. It's a fingerprint thingy. <laughs> <laughs> you dick. It's a fingerprint thingy. So... A hash, the most common, or the one that most people are familiar with is MD5, right? And it stands for Message Digest Version 5. And a Message Digest is a 128-bit uh, checksum. So the checksum that gets generated is essentially going to be 32 hexadecimal characters, regardless of the amount of data that you shove into it, uh, a megabyte, 3K, 3 bytes, 10 gigs. It's going to give you 32 hexadecimal characters. And it's going to say, that's the fingerprint. If you change anything in the file itself, if I change a single bit from a zero to a one, the MD5 is going to be different, right? The hashing algorithm that goes into is referred to as a one-way algorithm. So you cannot retrieve back the data that you originally had. If I have a 10 gigabyte file, right? And I run MD5, I forgot my file names again. If I run MD5 sum, uh, win to Lin, right? And I get these 32 characters, right? There's my MD5. There's no way to get back the original data that was in that file. I can't get that back. If I don't have the file and all I have is that hash, I can't get it back. If it's a malware sample and it's been uploaded to some system like hybrid analysis or virus total, well, then I can just go to that system and then I can grab it from there, right? However, if it's unique to my environment, like this obviously is, you're not gonna get that back. No. So one of the things that I also ask is like, hey, I have a hash, I need the original data, how do I get it? And some people are like, oh, you just do the conversion and then you can get back. And I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. So I have 32 hex characters and I wanna get back a gig of data, how do I do that? And they're like, well, Magic. I'm sure there's a, I think there's an online command for that. And I'm like, no, there isn't. So anyway, uh, what was the command that we did here? I did DOS to Unix and I did win example and then I did Perl. Okay, so now we want to do MD5 sum win example. 
And you'll notice I get the exact same MD5 sum, even though I did the conversion using two different methods. Yeah. One method that I did was literally using DOS to Unix. And it says, and I'm going to go ahead and do that for you. Mm -hmm. And then the other method was using Perl to do it. So using Perl, I just said, replace those with just that. It gives you the exact same data out. And you can verify that by using that little bugger right there. And by the way, say you have MD5 sum, and I want to get out the hash. Again, field one, it's like, oh, it's the whole field one, right? But if you force the delimiter, delimiter, or excuse me, uh, space, field one, and there it is. All right, let me close this on Windows machine. All right, and let's go back to cat. Oh, no, let's go CD and cat unknown. Okay, so going back once again to the MAC address. So at this point, we've talked about bits to bytes and words and talked about the OUI. We've changed ours if config eth zero, oops, eth zero grep ether, right? We changed ours to that. So we talk about those type of things. I also like to ask about things like, at layer two, what is the primary man in the middle methodology? Meaning art poisoning, yeah. right? So in art poisoning, what is the mechanism that actually poisons the network? What's well, referred to as a gratuitous ARP. So a lot of people will, in, the, in an interview, they'll be like, oh yeah, art poisoning. You'll be like, oh, okay, what, what's that? How's that work? How do you do that? And they'll be like, oh, uh, I just know it lets you like, you know, man in the middle of the connection. Right. Well, the most common tool that's used for that is EtherCap, and I think it's a capital G for GUI. Yeah. So EtherCap allows you to start sniffing and then to set targets based on IPs and, and MAC addresses and all kinds of stuff. I don't want to get that's a whole nother session just going over that kind of stuff. Uh, but the general idea is when people are talking about it, it's fun to see if they know like which tools actually do it. Right. So oops. Uh oh. Uh oh. Oh no, the whiskey got me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, damn it, Brian. All right. So other things we like to talk about. And, and again, this is, we're based, I'm basing all this just on a Mac address, right? Yep. The six byte puzzle mystery. <laughs> I got to come up with a name. You can do with a Mac address. I got to come up with a name. Yeah, a lot you can do with a Mac address, right? Mm -hmm. So now we start talking about things like this. If I say like, okay, what is the process of XORing? What's an XOR? What's an exclusive OR? You know, encryption method. So it's not tech. Oh, that's a whole nother thing we're going to do, by the way. We're going to talk about um, encoding versus encryption. Oh, okay. That's that's a whole other thing, right? So it's more of a of kind of type of encoding kind of thing. So XOR is stands for exclusive OR, and it's a type of bitwise operation. So a lot of different times, malware or even antivirus like engines, when they quarantine a file they will actually xor it and then still store it technically somewhere in the, in the operating system mm -hmm. and that's what it's something else won't find it it can't execute because it's been xored exclusive ord right mm -hmm. so if we talk about xoring if i go into uh, python and i ask someone like all right well xor these two values right how do you do that it's ridiculously simple it's ox 9c XOR, the bitwise operation for XOR is a caret in Python. Hmm. And then I just do OXB6. Boom. 42. Ah, the answer's 42. <laughs> it is 42. I did that on purpose, just so you know. No, I didn't. <laughs> no, I didn't. That's just pretty cool. All right, so what is this actually doing? Like, what is a bitwise operation? Well, one of the things you can do also in Python is I can say binary OX9C. Oops. And there's the binary value. Right, so we take this little book. We take this little guy right there, and let's open it. I like to use the site or site or whatever it's called, text editor. I think I got this from Didier Stevens of the Sands Group. He loves this tool, and I think he just kind of got me stuck on it. So there's our value, right? And then I want to get the binary value of B6, which is that. Let me take this little fart right there, and put it right there. Right, so zero B just means binary. Let's get rid of that, right? So bitwise operations, what are they? Well, a bitwise operation for exclusive OR, like an OR 
would be if you're oring two values, mm -hmm. and typically or is specified as like that. Mm -hmm. uh, an anding would be that. Anyways, I'm, I'm getting off track a little bit. All right, XOR. Let's focus on XOR. XOR. Exclusive or means you match the bits bit per bit, and exclusively, if you have an or, the value will be one. Meaning, this is a one and that's a one. If we're doing an or one or one equals one, we'd be like, yeah, at least one of them is a one. Yeah. But an exclusive or, you go, they're both ones, so no. It's not, a one. it's not yeah, it's a zero. And then zero, zero, zero. Yeah. But then here, you have one, and then you have a zero. So at least so only one of them. Exclusively, if it's exclusively an or. If it's an or. Then it's gonna be yep, what's the next value? Two. All right, so we have this binary value here. And then I can just do hex zero B, paste that in, two A, and then I do int zero X two A. And the answer is? 42, huh? Isn't that, isn't that great? Always. Yeah, I didn't plan that at all. <laughs> I was just really excited about that. Yay! That was nerdy, all right, here you go. Tink. Okay, so when people are like, yeah, I know what XORing is, it's like, all right, do it. So you go up to the whiteboard and you're like, here, Here's some here's some binary values. Just throw zeros and ones. Like here, XOR, and they're like, oh, I, 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 I. Um, you can get more into like write a Python script to actually take the contents of a file. So you'd have to do something like, you know, I or excuse me, like file name equals and then open and then a file name farts.txt. And then this you'd have to open it as a, a read binary. So you're reading it as a binary. Anyways, I'm, I'm Getting a little further in here, but the idea is that you don't have to get into all that. It's just the general concept of do you know what that even means, right? What is that? Another concept is taking a value and rotating. There's a rotate right, rotate left, and there's also shifting left and shifting right. So what we're going to look at is uh, let's do this. Let's go Firefox. And let's talk about burp, 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 Python bitwise. Bitwise operations. I'm talking to myself. There we go. All right. So bitwise operations and making sure chat works. No one's here. It's been like one person the whole time. No one's here. That's all right. So we go down. It'll go to YouTube. The whole point is going, you know, you and I covering things and then going to YouTube. That's right. So over here, we can do shifting. So a shifting basically means if I'm going to shift to the left yeah. is I shift every value over. So I take my most significant bit, yeah. right? So if I have this value and I'm going to shift it, I take my most significant bit, I get rid of it and I simply add a zero to the least significant bit okay. like that. So if I were to go like this, is it always zero? Uh, yes, with shifting, yes. Rotating, no, you actually map, the, you actually rotate it around. You keep the value. Yeah. And this one, it goes into what they call it, the bit bucket or whatever it's called. <gasps> Hi. Hey, Sap Homo, what's up? She and I are going to lunch on Monday to talk about, I was going to say tweeting, tweeting together. <laughs> Not tweeting, what am I talking about? To uh, uh, twitchy, twitching, twitching. Twitching, streaming, sure. All right, so if I go back into Python, and uh, what was our original value? I don't know, hell, I already forgot. One second. Uh, if config, what were we using? Okay, 9C. All right, so we go back into Python. Right, if I have 0x 9C, like that. Shut up, Adam. And I have 0x 9C. And I go like, uh, which way are we going? We're going left? Left by one. Damn it, don't be a dick. Two. It's two of them. Like this, you get 3112. And you go hex. 3112. Son of a bitch. Brian and his whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so you have this original decimal or uh, binary value. And you go over here. I'll go back in the thing hopper, and Python, go like this. And I'm a clipboard. Okay. And I go zero, eh, zero B, there, right, 156. Yeah. So I have this binary value, and if we did it manually, and we did our shifting, right, and again, we'll do it again. So 
So we go over here. Come here, booger. You go like that. You take the most significant, if we're shifting left, mm -hmm. toss it. And then over here, you go like this, right? So what's that value? Well, you can put a zero B here. And then like this. And then like that. 56. Yep. And then you can do a hex 56. And it ends up being a 38. So when people are saying, you know, in an interview, for example, they're like, yeah, I know about bitwise operations and XORing and, and rotating and, and shifting. You're like, all right, do it. Like, just do it. Mm -hmm. So you just bring up, whether it's Python or you just like, just turn the laptop around. Like, all right, go. I'm like, what do you got? I'm like, you go. Show me what you got there, buddy. All right. So we did some of that stuff. Uh, another thing I want to talk about is this. So another really big thing that's pervasive, and you and I have talked about this a million times already, is like base 64. All right, so you have cat unknown. I want to base 64 this. So I want to get the base 64 equivalent of that MAC address. How can I get that? Pipe it into base 64. Now, when I do this, I get this value, right? So the idea is that folks understand initially what base 64 is, obviously, right? So we go to Firefox. And we'll just go base 64. I bet wiki comes up first, of course. So Wikipedia comes up, and you and I have talked about this. It's also in my plural site class, and I'll try not to hoard out in every video. But I have a plural site class. Highly recommended plural it's, site class, it's, by the way. It's so great. Oh my goodness. Three of them. Hands on uh, three of them. This one, hands on instant response fundamentals. It's a uh, it's a paid site, but if you want thirty days free, just just hit me up. I'll give you thirty days free. Anyway, so in there I talk about like character conversions and things of that nature. Right, mm -hmm. right, forty two. Right. 42. Yeah, Sapphire was like, 42. I was like, oh, it's 42. It does some shit. Yep, yep. All right, so base 64, what it tries to do is it tries to chunk things evenly into essentially, uh, we're just talking about padding, bup, 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 divisible by three of six bytes. So you can easily identify base 64. In fact, pulling it back a little bit, base 64 was originally created because in the SMTP protocol, you could use ASCII, and ASCII at the time was seven bits. So you could basically have 127 different characters. And the reason for that is that if I do 0B, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, it's 127, right? A total of 127 different possible characters. Yep. And if I go back over to Firefox and I say lower ASCII, going back to initially when we we're looking at the ASCII and hex table, mm -hmm. right? Lower ASCII was like, well, we'll use English as the represent representational language. So we essentially, it was nice of them for us, yeah. <laughs> us americans so characters we get uppercase and lowercase letters we get actually some control characters too like the bell here's the bell is zero seven so you can actually if you echo a zero seven in the terminal you'll actually get your system beep like bing or whatever your dong whatever you're set to <laughs> yeah so uh i had a point to all this what was it what was the point to all this uh history of base 64 there we go so in Using only ASCII, you couldn't take raw binary data and shove it into an email, yeah. right? So what they did is they're like, okay, well, what if we can encode any binary data, whether it be a graphic a picture of a stupid cat or something like that, or hey Zeus, come here, hey, well, you're a stupid cat. hey, he's he's well trained. Here he comes. Hey, he's just slow. Come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. Uh, what we got? Come here. This is Junior. This is uh, She's like, I'm tapping on the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Zeus, come here. You too. It's your time to shine, buddy. Come on. Uh, he's huge. There. If I want to send a picture of this little fart right there, right? I'm like, oh, I'm a fart. All right, get off me. I'm done with you. <laughs> If I want to send a picture of them, I can encode it in base 64, which means only relying on those 127 possible characters. So they decided on a, a Radix 64. So what that means is you can encode using A through Z capital, yep. A through Z lowercase, yep. right? So A through Z is 26 characters. Mm -hmm. Lowercase A through Z is another 26 characters. What's 26 times two? 26 times oh, two? Yeah, don't fuck it up. 52. Hurry up. All right. All right. <laughs> 26 times 2 is 52, according to this guy. 26 times 2. 26 times 2. You want to add it up again? 
No, I'm just I'm making a joke because then a lot of interviews people like I go 26 times two and they're like ah uh, ah. Uh. <laughs> All right, so then you can also have zero through nine, uh-huh. which is ten, yeah. which is sixty-two. But then you can also use a forward slash and plus. I don't know why they chose those; they just did. Question. Yes. Are they used in any particular order? When yeah, I mean the algorithm chooses when they're used, and like you said, you see a lot of capital A's for uh, white space and zeros and things like that. So if I have uh, echo farts and I pipe it to base 64, mm-hmm. right? There's no padding on that. It happens to be divisible evenly by three based on the algorithm. But if I do farts space, I get two equal signs. If I do farts space space, I get one equal sign. And if I add another space, no equal signs. No equal. But you'll notice now instead of HMK, I have HM and then I have GICACAC. <laughs> C-A-K. So going back to my whole point, if you're trying to do cat unknown, right? So we have this MAC address mm-hmm. and we pipe this to base 64. Excuse me, we have a problem. And the problem is that this base 64 value itself, if I were to uh, say, take that exact value, right? So we have just the base 64 value. Mm-hmm. And then I pipe it right back to base 64 dash D, which on a Macintosh, by the way, is capital D. I don't know why they made that change. Base 64 D, it looks like I have the same value, right? Looks like. But if I then pipe that to XXD, you'll notice that we have once again our little buddy down here. Zero A. And that's because whenever you run cat in Lin- in Linux, what it does is it adds in a new line character. Very similar to if I were to simply do the following. If I take this and put it on my clipboard, and then I do echo. You'll notice that when I run echo, you get your value, but then on the next line down, you get your prompt, Mm -hmm. right? If I do echo and then I go to XXD, you'll see once again, we have at the bottom 0A, which is the Linux uh, line feed. I prefer OA. (laughs) Yeah, OA as I like to call it, right? So to get rid of that, one of the things you can do using echo is use dash N. It means don't add the new line. When I do that, you'll notice I don't actually get that, Hmm. right? So sometimes we'll ask someone like, if you cat a file into base 64, you may get extraneous data. What might that be? And if they're familiar with the fact that cat by default will add that, and they're like, well, if you want to cat something and not, oops, that's not right, and then not do that, how could you do that? And then they're like, well, uh, uh, uh. So the whole idea is whether they understand that whatever you pipe directly into that base 64 processor mm-hmm. is going to take exactly what's coming in through that pipe. And what's coming through that pipe, if you just do an echo without a dash in, or if you just do a cat, it's going to include that new line character. Yeah. All right, so those are the normal things that I hit that are all based on MAC address. Now, there's a lot more depending upon, like, the level. If, it, you know, we don't have levels at day job, which I won't mention where, what my day job is. Like, you can't just go LinkedIn, the damn thing. But... Uh, you know, we talked about replacing those. We talked about the OUIs. We talked about hex to ASCII conversions. We hit a, a, a bunch of stuff. And it all really just starts with the damn MAC address. It does. Right? And at the end of the day, we still have that set for our MAC address. So if we go back to MAC changer P, here we got our VMware one once again. And then we can do if config zero, and we're back to our VMware one. So, uh, I want to talk forever because that's what I like to do, but what are we at here? Like an hour? How long has it been? Oh, an hour and 17 minutes. I think it's time to shut the hell up for now. Uh, yeah. 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 I kind of want to do another DEF CON workshop submission. Do you have another, do you have half an hour, an hour? Okay. Let's, let's stop this stream, take like a five or 10 minute break and then spin that up. Let's do it. Because I want to submit one on shellcode analysis. Let's do it. Let's do it. I want to learn about shellcode analysis. All right, cool. So uh, yeah, for anyone who watched, thanks for hanging out. For the most part, it was like one to two people. But uh, the, the the main point of doing a lot of these videos is that uh, Adam and I are doing some training together. And if folks happen to join on Twitter, like awesome. But I'll be pushing these all to YouTube. What did I say? Twitter. Shut up, Adam. <laughs> Brian is Brian and his damn truck full of whiskey. That bastard. <laughs> Ah, so anyways, I'll be pushing all these videos over to YouTube. I think I already pulled it up. YouTube.com slash 
C slash Ryan Chapman J. So this is going to go under, I got to make a new one. I did a stream last week, last week, two weeks ago, where I submitted to DEF CON, but I failed an OPSEC and I had my phone number all over the text files. <laughs> so I'm still editing that offline. So anyways, the DEF CON workshop people can actually see it. The call for paper folks, approval board, what have you. Oh, okay. It's unlisted. So they can still see it and they can call me and be like, dude, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Security 101, bro. I'm like, shh, shut up. All right, so let's kill this. Let's come back at, uh, what time is it? I don't know, come back in about 2.30ish, 10, 10, 12 minutes, and then we'll do a switch over to a Windows VM, and I'll do another workshop submission for DEF CON. Okay. Ah. All right, for the folks who are in the chat, Sap Homo and whoever else is there, I don't know that person, XXAR15 fan. Oh, I bet I know who that is. I'll leave out his name, but I bet I have an idea what that is. Well, he's here. Thanks for watching. Yeah, thanks for hanging out. All right, so we're going to be back in about 10, 12 minutes. Holla!